if it's okay with everyone, I am recording this session. So I'll put it up on the YouTube channel so that everyone else can see it because it is going to be quite an inspiring evening. Um, and Matt is here. He's the guru of all things Japan. And he has been to so many places there, although it sounds like there's still a couple of places left that he has on his list. So yes, just enjoy the presentation and see how much you learn about Japan. If you've been before, if you've never been, if you've never thought of going, then hopefully it'll inspire you to, to just think about a different destination. So yeah, over to Matt. Cool. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. I'll just share my screen and share the sound so that you can see it all. Um, hopefully you can all see that. Okay, give me some thumbs up if you can see it. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Brilliant. Okay. Right. In that case, I'll kick off. So yeah, thank you very much for having me this evening. Uh, my name's Matt. I work for a company called Inside Japan Tours, um, and we're the UK's leading specialist for travel to Japan. I lived in Japan for three years um, in a tiny little town called Hagi on the south of the main island. And Hagi was a really beautiful little town. I was a um, English teacher in uh, elementary schools and senior high schools. Um, and yeah, it's basically where modern Japan stemmed from. So not many people outside of Japan have ever heard of it, um, but it's very famous within Japan. Um, years and years and years ago, uh, at one point, all of the ports in Japan were closed off, apart from a few select ports which were open to traders. So nobody could come into Japan and nobody could leave Japan. And during that time, five samurai from Hage, Hagi, um, they, sm they made a deal with an English captain and and smuggled themselves on an English ship and they um, sailed back to the UK and studied at UCL in London and learned about the modern Western world. They then went back to Japan and were part of the Meiji Restoration, which is where they overthrew um, the shogunate, um, uh, so overthrew the war warlords and gave power back to the emperor. Um, and they were involved in that. And then one of them became the first prime minister of Japan. One of them brought the trains and railroads to Japan. One of them opened the Royal Mint in Japan. So this small town had a, a lot of influence on how um, Japan modernized. Um, but the ironic thing is that uh, uh, it's, it's a still completely traditional and not modern at all. So you've got lots of little streets with wooden houses and pottery and yeah it was just an amazing place to stay so I highly recommend uh, visiting Hagi even though th not that many foreign tourists will actually go there. So I'm just going to show you a little video to give you an, a sort of idea of what we do. <laughs>
so that's just a taster of what you can expect from a trip to Japan. Um, as you'll see, it's all about the modern culture um, thrown together with the uh, traditional culture. Um, it's all about the big cities and the rural landscapes. It's all of these contrasts and juxtapositions that make Japan such a fascinating place. So a little bit about the geography of Japan. Um, there's 6,582 islands that make up Japan, so there is a lot to do and see. Um, if you speak to South Korea um, or Russia or China or Taiwan, they might dispute that number of islands, but it's around six and a half thousand islands. 70% uh, mountainous, so inland is mainly mountains and then most people live on the coastline. It's about the same land mass as Germany, and there's almost 30,000 kilometres of coast to explore. Um, so I don't know if Melissa fancies walking that amount of coastline after, after a weekend. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, lots to see and do, lots to explore. In terms of population, about 126 million people live in Japan, so about twice the size of the UK. 35 million of those live in Tokyo, so about half the population of the UK lives in Tokyo alone. So it is a massive city, um, but even though it is big and it is busy, it's, it's, it's chaotic, but it's a really orderly kind of chaos. There's no pushing or shoving or anything like that. It just somehow works and everyone is very respectful of each other. So the different islands of Japan, so up to the north, you've got the island of Hokkaido. Um, this hasn't been inhabited as long as the other islands of you know, Japan. Um, so it hasn't got the same depth of culture in terms of big shrines and big sh temples that you've got on the other islands. But what you have got on this island is great ski resorts. So it's really famous for winter sports. Um, I've skied all over the world and this is the best powder snow I have ever been on and then in the winter as well you've also got um, uh, great bird watching so you've got the Japanese cranes in winter doing their um, mating dance you've got stellar sea eagles blackest and fish owls so really unique wildlife up there on that island and then in the summer you've got really beautiful national parks flower fields it's all about the great outdoors um, but like I said, it hasn't got the same depth of culture as the mainland. So most people wouldn't go here on a first time trip to Japan. You'd probably save that for a second or third time trip. Then you've got the main island of Honshu, which I will talk about um, later and go into a bit more detail. But this is where you've got your main sites of Tokyo, Mount Fuji, Kyoto, Hiroshima. And this, this is what most people would do on their first time trip to Japan. Then you've got the island of Shikoku. Um, so Shikoku literally means um, fourth country. So it's the fourth largest island in Japan. Um, again, quite rural. Um, you've got vine bridges and valleys and gardens and castle towns. Um, it's really a bit more off the beaten track than it is the mainland, but it is connected to the mainland by train and road. So it is accessible if you want to do something a little bit different, but still link it in with some of the major sites on the main island. And then down south, you've got the island of Kyushu. Um, so Kyushu is accessible from the mainland by bullet train and there is a bullet train that runs all the way down to the south of this island. Um, it's a very volcanic island. I mean, all of Japan is volcanic, but this island in particular is quite volcanic. So you've got um, volcanoes like Sakurajima and Mount Aso, which are still live and smoking away. Um, you've got um, where this statue is, um, that's in Nagasaki, in the Peace Park in Nagasaki. Um, and it, 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 it's where the second atomic bomb was dropped in Japan. Um, so Nagasaki's got that history and the Peace Park and, and the museum is definitely worth visiting. But also Nagasaki at one point was one of these only ports that was open to the outside world. So it's got quite a lot of Dutch influence and Chinese influence. So quite a unique town to visit. And then dotted around the island, there's all of these other tiny islands with ancient forests, with um, cedar trees, which are thousands of years old and 10 meters wide, unique wildlife. So it's quite it's quite a, a rough and rural and, and rustic island, this island itself. And then down to the south, you've got the islands of Okinawa. Um, so these are subtropical all year round. They're actually closer to Taiwan than they are to mainland Japan. Great beaches, um, snorkeling, scuba diving, mangroves. Um, so yeah, a really different vibe to the, to the mainland Japan. Um, it's great for a few nights, um, 
but uh, if you are spending time on the mainland and then flying down to Okinawa, it can add um, quite considerable cost onto your trip. And whilst the beaches are great, I wouldn't say they're anything to compare to Thailand beaches, Vietnam, Cambodia beaches, uh, Southeast Asia. They're great, but they're, they're, they're not quite set up for tourism and Western tourists and having the resorts and accommodation that you would find elsewhere in Asia. So you do have to sort of have your expectations managed a little bit for Okinawa. So why would you go to Japan? Um, Japan is unique. There are things in Japan that you wouldn't see anywhere else in the world. So you've got your sumo, samurai, geisha, Mount Fuji, bullet trains, and all of these things are great. And all of these are good reasons to go to Japan. But I actually think it's the little tiny things that Japan does differently that really makes for a memorable trip. They literally do everything slightly differently. Um, so taxis, so taking a taxi is an experience. Taxi doors will open and close for you automatically. They're powered by the driver. Um, if you see inside, um, there's all the seats are covered in white covers and the headdress will be covered in white lace. The driver will be in a suit with white gloves. So even taking a taxi in Japan is an experience. Then you've got the bullet train on the top right. Um, so this is all of the staff that have just cleaned the bullet train. They then come out and bow to everyone um, before they get on the train. And you'll notice that everyone waiting to get on the train is waiting in an orderly queue. And this is because on the bullet train platforms, they'll have markers to show which train and which carriage is going to stop at which point. So that if you've got your seat reservation, you know exactly where to wait. Everyone waits in an orderly queue and there's no pushing or shoving or running down the platform to get to the right carriage like you've get, got here in the UK. Um, it's, it's all quite an experience. Um, and then ticket conductors, they will uh, bow to the entire carriage before entering and leaving a carriage and say sorry for disturbing you and then uh, check your tickets and then bow before leaving the carriage. So even just taking a train in Japan is an experience. Then you've got toilets. Um, and I was saying earlier that Japan has contrasts and extremes. Um, taking the toilet in Japan, um, it's no different. So in more rural areas and bars and restaurants, um, the toilet will be quite uh, quite basic and just be a hole in the ground. But then everywhere else, it will be these high tech toilets and there just doesn't seem to be anything in between. It's either the low tech or the high tech. Um, so the high tech toilets will have heated toilet seats. They'll have buttons which um, squirt, squirt jets of water from different angles. Um, and in public ones as well, sometimes they'll have um, buttons that will either play music or will play the sound of running water to um, disguise and mask the noises that you're making in there so that nobody else around you has to hear you doing your business. So taking the toilet, in the, going to the toilet in Japan is a uh, real experience. And you'll notice there a photo of toilet slippers. Um, so in Japan, when you go to bars and restaurants, uh, uh, more, more, more restaurants than bars. Um, so when you go to a restaurant, quite often um, it will be traditional. So they'll have tatami mat floors and they don't want to ruin the tatami mat floors. So you'll change from your shoes into restaurant slippers so that you're not taking germs from the outside in and ruining the tatami mats. Um, so you'll use the restaurant slippers to get around the restaurants and to your table. Um, and then if you want to go to the toilet, you then change into toilet slippers. Um, and that's to stop um, germs and dirt spreading from inside the toilet back into the restaurant. Um, so yeah, even that in Japan is a real experience. Um, and if you've had a few beers, um, sometimes you forget to change from the toilet slippers back into the restaurant slippers. So that's quite embarrassing. Um, but the great thing about Japan is that they've got all of these rules, they've got all of this etiquette, but they completely understand that you won't understand it and won't know it. Um, so I know a lot of other countries in Asia, there's some, if you break etiquette, you can get in trouble or it's taboo. Japan, it's totally fine. They'll see it as an opportunity to explain their culture to you. So I wouldn't worry about, about breaking any rules when you're over there. Then you've got big cities. So Tokyo and Osaka, they're really great fun. But in contrast to that as well, you've got really beautiful countryside. Like I said earlier, that's 70% mountainous. So there's so much beautiful scenery around Japan. Then you've got the food. Um, our Jap Japanese food is amazing and whatever you've tried of Japanese food over here it's not authentic and it will not be good uh, compared to what you can get in Japan. Um, it is 
absolutely amazing. It's quite a varied cuisine. So it's not just fish. It's not just raw fish and sushi. Um, there is so much more to the food than that. So you've got Japanese curries, you've got indoor barbecues, you've got okonomiyaki, which is a savory pancake. You've got fried noodles, you've got soup, noodle soups, you've got kebabs. So these yakitori skewers. There is so much to Japanese food. Um, my sister was 13 when she came to visit me in Japan and she was at that point one of the fussiest eaters ever um, and we still found plenty of food for her in Japan that she loved and still still eats to this day. Then you've got amazing wildlife so I mentioned the bird life on Hokkaido earlier but then you've got snow monkeys, flying squirrels, um, tame deer that just walk around parks and shrines and temples so unique wildlife to be seen and then really beautiful gardens throughout the country so this is Ken Rokuen garden in Kanazawa um, so you've got these great big public gardens which are beautiful throughout the year but then you've also just people's front gardens are, are immaculate and really beautifully done so if you're into your garden in Japan's a great place for you and then you've got hot springs um, so uh, Japan is volcanic and there are hot springs throughout the entire country um, and I definitely recommend doing the hot springs it's just way of life out there each local town and village will have their own local public hot spring um, and then as a treat maybe for the weekends the Japanese will go away for a um, hot spring resort as a treat for a weekend. Um, hot springs are men and women separate and you usually do go in naked so you're in your birthday suit um so quite often some some of us brits are a bit nervous uh, about doing that but i i totally recommend just just it's just their way of life and they're not bothered about everyone being naked so you shouldn't be bothered um but if you are a bit shy there are ways of, around being naked in front of people which i'll explain later on and then a lot of people don't think of Japan as an outdoors destination, but um, there's lots of hiking, lots of, so you can climb Mount Fuji. There's lots of ancient pilgrimage routes that you can do multi-day hikes on. There's lots of cycling. You can do day tours or, and multi-day tours. So yeah, it's not just um, about shrines and temples. There is a lot of outdoors culture to Japan as well. Then you've got great art, um, great modern uh, art and great traditional Japanese art. Um, so you've got your woodblock prints called ukiyo-e um, and then you, the modern art, so this pumpkin is um, on an island called Nawashima and the entire island has been dedicated to modern art. So you've got sculptures and installations and, and museums all over this island. So if you're into your art, there's plenty to see and do in Japan. And then you've got your pop culture. So your manga and anime cartoons and video games, cosplay, dressing up. And this, this is the really quirky side of Japan. All of this pop culture and modern, modern um, pop culture is found side by side with all of the tradition and culture. So it is, it's a fun, vibrant place to be. And everywhere you turn, there's something cute or colorful or traditional. There's, this, there's always something happening. But what I would say about Japan is that um, the, the, the people are so kind and so friendly. They're so proud of their country. They love their country and they will really go out of their way to make sure you, they, you love it as much as they do. Um, so who is Japan for? I would say it's literally for anyone, families, solo travelers, couples, friends, anyone can go to Japan and that is because it is extremely safe. When you go there you will feel very calm, very safe. Quite often you see kids like this walking home by themselves. It's got one of the lowest crime rates in the world. Um, so yeah, I would, wouldn't discourage anyone from going to Japan. You will always feel safe and calm. So when's the best time to go? Um, so most people know Japan for the cherry blossoms and that is is the famous time to go. It is the busiest time to go, and most popular time to go. Um, but for good reason, it is really, really beautiful. Every shrine, every temple, every park, every river in a town will be lined with cherry blossom trees. And there's just this beautiful pink and white canopy throughout the country um, at that time of year. Um, really, people let their hair down at that time of year. So they'll have hanami parties, which are cherry blossom viewing parties. So they'll have picnics under the trees, um, eat food, drink sake, drink beer. And it's just a fun time to be in Japan. Um, so yeah. I would say on the main island, when I talk about the seasons, the I'm talking about the main island, the other islands will differ slightly. Um, 
but the main island cherry blossom tends to be the last week and a half of March and first two weeks of April. It depends on the weather. Um, so uh, it, it, sometimes they open early, sometimes they open late. They're only usually open for maybe a, a week or, or maybe two weeks. Um, so it all depends on the weather. But I'd say if you've got a two week trip from the 20th of March to the, maybe the 14th of April, if you've got a trip between those dates, you're probably going to see the cherry blossoms at some point. Then summer is June through to September. I'm not going to lie, it's really hot and it's really humid. So if you are flexible on dates, I would probably avoid the summer just because of the humidity. Um, but we know some people aren't uh, flexible on dates and you have to go in the school holidays. But it's still a good time to go. Everywhere is air conditioned and every town and, and, and city will have its own summer festival um, during the summer. Um, so dance parades, fireworks, lantern parades. So it is a fun and vibrant time to be in Japan. And July and August is the only time that you can actually climb Mount Fuji. Then you've got autumn, October and November. Um, autumn is my favourite time to be in Japan. I think it's just as beautiful as the cherry blossoms, the reds, the oranges, the yellows. Um, their autumn season is, is a bit later than ours, so I'd say it only really starts in the mountains at the end of October. November is peak autumn season um, and the autumn leaves are out longer, so four to six weeks, whereas the cherry blossoms is a two week um, sort of scramble to see them. Um, so it's, it's still busy and it's still not the cheapest time to be in Japan, but um, because it's over a longer period, it doesn't feel as hectic and chaotic as the cherry blossoms. So it, it, I, I personally think autumn is a great time to go. November is, is the absolute best time to see the autumn leaves. And then you've got winter, so end of December through to February. Um, winter is a cold, but a crisp cold, a clear blue sky, nice dry, crisp cold rather than a damp, wet, um, cold here in the UK. Um, really beautiful time to be in Japan, lots of snow, taking a hot spring bath. Um, so December through to February, outdoor hot spring baths are just magical in, in, in the winter. And then moving on to accommodation, where would you stay if you went on trips to Japan? Um, you've got great Western style hotels throughout the country and we'd recommend staying in those in the cities. But then when you're out in rural destinations, you should definitely try staying at a ryokan. So a ryokan is a Japanese style hotel. So it's a traditional inn. Um, it's all about relaxing and enjoying the hospitality. So this room here with the low table, that's your it's your living room, it's your dining room, and it's your bedroom all in one. So they move the tables and your dinner. Um, so you arrive and you'll have tea at that table. Then in the evening, they'll serve dinner on it. Um, and then in the evening, they'll move the table away and lay futons out for you to stay. It'll have hot springs to it to enjoy. So taking a, staying at a traditional inn is a real experience. Then you've got Minshuku, which are family run traditional inns. These are a bit more basic, um, maybe four or five rooms. Um, and uh, rooms aren't usually en suite, um, but having the feel of, of home cooked food and that kind of thing is a real experience. Then you've got Chukubo, which are temple lodgings. Um, so it's just like a ryokan, a traditional inn, but it's attached to a temple. So you can get up in the morning and you can join the monks for their morning prayers at five o'clock in the morning. So that's a really great experience. And then you've got Machio, which are renovated townhouses. So traditional townhouses. So you get the entire place to yourself and it's like living like a local basically. And then capsule hotels, um, not for everyone, um, but they are a great experience if you want to try that and we can arrange that. Um, so what about the price? Usually the elephant in the room isn't Japan expensive. Um, Japan isn't the cheapest destination in the world. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to say that. So the accommodation, the flights, the transport, the guide and the experiences that can add up to be an expensive trip. The actual day to day costs on the ground. So a soft drink from vendor machine, 90 pence, a subway journey, one to two pound, a bowl of ramen, pork noodle soup, five pound. You pay 15 pound for that here in London. Um, green tea is often free in restaurants. Shrine and temples, um, sh sorry, temples are about two to four pounds to get in. Compare that to a National Trust building over here, that's quite cheap. And then shrines are quite often free to get in. So it's actually not that expensive on the ground in Japan. And there's absolutely no tipping in Japan. It's just not part of their culture. Um, so yeah, uh, 
it doesn't have to be as expensive as you may think. Another concern we have from customers is the language barrier. Um, and I'm not going to lie, there is a language barrier. Uh, English isn't widely spoken outside of the big cities, um, but all of the major train stations will have English and Japanese signs. Um, and the Japanese language, actually, the, 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 the language barrier is part of the fun. People are so kind and friendly. They'll go out of their way to help you. And if they can't speak English, they'll point, they'll take you by the hand, they'll walk you 20 minutes out of their way to make sure you get there. So Japanese language is quite interesting. They've got three alphabets. They've got kanji, which is based on uh, Chinese characters. They've got hiragana, which is the Japanese phonetic alphabet. And then they've got katakana, which is the Japanese phonetic alphabet for foreign words. So there's three alphabets to learn in Japanese. Um, we're going to focus on kanji right now. Um, so kanji is the Chinese characters they use, and it's meant to represent the thing that they're describing. So this is nin, and this is meant to be person. Um, this is yama. I don't know if you want anybody wants to unmute themselves. Um, I don't know if Melissa, you want to have a guess as well. Um, can you guess what a uh, yama is? Anybody? I really should be able to think of something, but I don't think my brain's with me right now. <laughs> well, you might have walked over some of these on the weekend. So yama is <laughs> mountain. Um, then we've got ki, which is, can anybody guess what ki is? Is that forest? Oh, oh, you're, you're close. So key uh, is tree mm -hmm. and then mura is a wood and yeah. then mori is forest. So <laughs> you, you were almost there. You were almost there. But when you start linking up the language, it does start to make sense after a while. So then we've got he, which is fire. And we've got yeah. hanabi, which means flower fire. Can anybody guess what flower fire means? autumn no the good guess though because the fire um the fire uh, kanji does feature in the word autumn um but hanabi flower fire is actually fireworks oh. so it starts to make sense when you get used to japanese language and it's really worth learning a few words before you go <laughs> Moving on from that, then I'll quickly take you through what you can expect from eight nights in, in Japan. So this is a, a good base for any trip to Japan. Um, and then if you want to go for two weeks, you can maybe add on extra destinations after these three. So it's called the Golden Route. So you'll start off in Tokyo for three nights, then two nights in Hakone National Park and then three nights down in Kyoto. Um, so day one, you might arrive in, in, in Tokyo, have a private transfer across the Rainbow Bridge, arrive at the Gate Hotel, which is a great four star hotel right in the center of Tokyo. You'll uh, uh, receive our, our informa information pack from our office in Nagoya with all of your tickets. And then you'll go out, start exploring Tokyo by yourself using the public transport system. Maybe go to the Shibuya Crossing, the world's um, busiest um, pedestrian crossing maybe go to Meiji Shrine. So Meiji Shrine is the most prestigious, prestigious shrine in Tokyo. And quite often you see um, lots of wedding ceremonies take place. So you can quite often um, see couples like this dressed up in the wedding kimono. When my parents were in, in Tokyo with me, they saw a wedding take place and they really embarrassed me and asked me to ask the couple to have a wedding photo with them. They were more than happy to do it, um, but I was really embarrassed. Um, then outside Meiji Shrine, you've got Harajuku, which is the youth hub of, of Tokyo, where you've got all the youth culture with the crazy costumes, the crazy outfits. At Yoyogi Park on a Sunday, you quite often see the dancing Elvises. They're there all day on a Sunday and you quite often see bizarre things um, like dogs dressed in a kimono and this is all right outside that really traditional shrine so again it's all about the contrasts in Japan. Then you might go for dinner maybe you have ramen, pork noodle broth or okonomiyaki so this is the savoury pancake that you can cook in front of you um, and then you put these amazing sauces on top um, and, and yeah it's a real experience dining out in Japan. Then good night. And then the next day, you might have a, on day two a private day with a private guide. So this is Masa-san. He might take you around and uh, take you on the public transport system. You might start in Harajuku, um, not sorry, in Hamarikyu Gardens, um, this beautiful gardens right in the centre of Tokyo. And in that little tea house there, you can try Japanese green tea. 
After that, you'll take the water cruise um, right up the Sumida River to Asakusa, which is the traditional district of Tokyo and where you've got Sensoji Temple. So a real contrast to all of the skyscrapers. Then after that, you might go up Tokyo Tower, which is um, uh, Tokyo Skytree, which is the world's largest, tallest telecommunications tower. And you get great views out over the city and on a clear day views of Mount Fuji. Then in the evening, we might get one of our, um, our tour leaders to take you out for um, dining out. Um, so there's all of these little back streets and all of these little places called izakaya. So an izakaya is a Japanese pub. Um, and you go out and you have beers and you go into these little buildings and you they're all behind curtains and sliding doors so you might be a little bit nervous about doing that yourself on your first night in Japan but having someone take you out and experience it is really fun so you'll go you'll have maybe in one of these is a car you'll have yakitori which are these chicken skewers and you'll have a beer and then you'll move on to the next place which might specialize in fried chicken so you'll have fried chicken and another beer then the next place you move on and you try something different so it's a bit like tapas you move on from place to place trying all of lots of different foods all down these little back alleys and going out in Japan in the evening it's great fun people are friendly people like to drink they love their beer they love their sake um, but great thing about Japan is that they get happy drunk rather over here in the UK we get a bit bit sad drunk or angry drunk um, it's a really nice atmosphere going out in Japan day three you're on the uh, you can do a whatever you want. You can maybe go to Tsukiji Fish Market and have a sushi breakfast or make a day trip out of um, Tokyo. So 40 minutes to the south of Tokyo is Kamakura, where you've got this giant Buddha on the coast. And then to the north of Tokyo, you've got Nikko, about an hour and a half north of Tokyo. Um, UNESCO World Heritage Shrine, Shrines and Temples, where the hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil monkeys come from. Day four, you're then on a bullet train 40 minutes out of Tokyo to um, Hakone National Park. You might stay at the Motoyu Kansu Iro. So this is a beautiful traditional inn. This is an example of your guest room. And in the evening, that's where they'll serve your evening meal. And if you look out the back of your room, you'll notice there's a private little garden there. And here you'll have your own private hot spring bath. So this is how you get around being naked in front of other people. Some traditional inns will have private hot spring baths that you can use for yourself. And then in the National Park, you've got a um, great outdoor sculpture museum, uh, lots of famous artists with outdoor sculptures. And then in the evening, you go back to your rear can and have a kaiseki meal. Um, so this is a real experience. There'll be so many courses, so many different dishes. And yeah, it's an, an amazing experience that you have to do whilst you're staying at a traditional inn. And then in the evening, you'll sleep on futons on the floor. Then day five, you've got a free day to explore the national park by yourself. So this is a Wakudani. You'll take the cable car up the mountain and this is where they extract all the hot springs uh, out of the mountain and they pump it all down to the Rio can so that you can enjoy your hot springs. And here they boil eggs in the hot springs and the sulfur turns the hot, um, the sulfur turns the hot, uh, the eggs black. And apparently if you eat one of these eggs, it will add seven years to your life. I'm not sure if it's true. If it is true, all of our guides and tour leaders, they, they'll basically be living forever because they're eating these constantly. Then you could get a cable car down to Lake Ashi, which is this beautiful lake. Um, and you can take a boat across the lake. And on a clear day, you get really great views of Mount Fuji. So yeah, Hakone National Park is all about Mount Fuji. And then day six, you're on a bullet train out of uh, Hakone down to Kyoto for about two and a half hours on the train. Um, Kyoto is the cultural capital of Japan. It's an ancient capital of Japan, um, but it is still quite a modern city. So this is the train station and the view from the train station. But as you go beyond this, there are pockets of culture throughout. Um, uh, and it is traditional, all of these pockets of tradition. And it's got more UNESCO World Heritage Rites than any other uh, city in the world. Here you'll stay in a traditional townhouse. Um, so you'll be living like a local Kyotoite. Um, and then you can just go out, start exploring Kyoto by yourself. There's so much to see and do in this destination. Day seven, you might have a private guide for the day. So this is Kiona San. She'll take you out and explain all of the shrines and temples. So temples are Buddhist and, um, and, and shrines are Shintoist. And Shinto is the, the, um, uh, the, the religion of Japan and Buddhism came over from, from mainland Asia. 
So she'll take you around for the day. If you've watched the Paul Hollywood Eats Japan documentary on uh, Channel 4, you might recognize Kiyono-san because she showed Paul around Osaka and we were really proud to be involved in, in helping making that show. So she might make you to Kinkakuji Golden Pavilion. So this is a temple and it's Buddhist. Um, she might take you to Ranji Rock Gardens Temple. So again, that's Buddhist, really beautiful gardens to go and, and they're so peaceful and calm. Then Arashiyama Bamboo Grove, you can go explore. Or in the afternoon, we can arrange for you to go and meet a Maiko. So a Maiko is a trainee geisha. Um, and uh, a Maiko are what most people think of as geisha. Um, because they're still training their arts and they have to practice their dancing, singing, tea ceremony, entertainment. And because they're still apprentices, apprentices, um, they wear colorful costumes, colorful kimono. They have this elaborate makeup and they have these elaborate headpieces and hair. Um, and that's to distract you from the fact that they're not fully qualified yet. So they try and dazzle you with all of this beauty um, so that you can't quite see the imperfections with their dancing and tea ceremony. Um, but when they qualify then to be a geisha, a, a geiko, they don't have to wear as colorful costumes or have as much in their hair or have so much makeup. And you, it's all about their entertainment rather than what they look like. But um, to an untrained eye, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between their level of dancing and entertainment. But most, most of us want to see a Maiko rather than a ge Geiko. And then after that, you might go to Fushimi Inari Shrine. So this is Shintoist rather than Buddhist. And there's beautiful red gates leading up the mountain to the shrine. And then day eight, you've got a day by yourself. You might make a day trip to Nara. So Nara was another ancient capital about 40 minutes south of Kyoto. This is the world's largest wooden building and it is just spectacular. It is so huge. Or you've got Osaka, again, about 40 minutes from Kyoto bright lights, great for street food. It's known as the kitchen of Japan. So it's all about the food in Osaka. And every March they have a sumo tournament there. Or uh, Himeji is about 40 minutes away from um, Kyoto and it's got Japan's largest um, original castle. And then day nine, you can basically do whatever you want from there. You can maybe head down to Hiroshima and Miyajima, which is about two hours from Kyoto. Obviously where the atomic bomb was dropped and it's the Peace Park is done really, really well. And I definitely recommend going there and seeing. The museum itself is very hard hitting uh, and quite upsetting, but I think it's definitely worth a visit. Um, but to contrast that, just off the coast of Hiroshima is a really beautiful island of Miyajima. So we recommend staying there for a couple of nights and just relaxing for a couple of days. Or you can go up to Kanazawa in the north. Um, Kanazawa is known for arts and crafts and beautiful gardens and old samurai districts. Or you've got Shirakawago in the Japanese Alps, so these beautiful thatched um, cottages that you can actually stay in. Or Takayama, again, in the Japanese Alps, which is, again, famous for uh, uh, arts and crafts, but also famous for lots of sake breweries. So you can go along the sake breweries and do a little sake brewery tour. Then down south, you've got Mount Koya, so this um, temple complex on top of a mountain. And here you can stay at uh, temple lodgings and, and see all of the monks going about doing their business. And then the Kumano Kodo is these ancient pilgrimage routes. Um, and you hike from shrine to shrine um, and you forward your luggage on. So you do multi-day hiking, forward in your luggage on in advance. So you just hike with your small backpack through beautiful scenery like this. And it really is spectacular. And we can do three or four, two, three, four nights on this route. Easy, intermediate, advanced hiking, something for everyone, really. So if you're into your hiking, I'd really recommend the Kamano Kodo. And that's basically it. So there's so much to see and do in Japan. Um, and yeah, we can basically arrange anything for you. So yeah, I don't know if... Oh, we also got other countries for other parts of Asia we also offer um, with our Inside Asia brand. And that's basically it. So does anybody have any questions? That was brilliant, Matt. Wow, there is so much. I can't believe it. There will definitely be questions. Um, there are some that have come through on my phone anyway as well. Um, but yeah, if anyone else has any, if, they, if you want to message them in the chat or unmute yourselves to, to ask, that's absolutely fine. Um, <laughs> well, I was going to say that um, 
I just I, I quite love the opening part of the the toilet um, shoes. Actually, <laughs> thought it was brilliant. And funnily enough, one of the questions is about that. Do the do you have restaurant and toilet slippers personal to you? Um, no, so so they, they will be yours. Um, Whilst you're there, you get into the restaurant. Mm -hmm. They will be given to you. You'll have a little locker. You can put your shoes in, and then you have your slippers in the restaurant that you keep for yourself. And they do clean them in between guests using them. Um, the toilet slippers, um, they're not personal to you. They will be laid out, and you just use which ones are, are in front of you. But again, they're cleaned quite regularly. Japan is a very clean place. Everything is cleaned all of the time. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, it definitely sounds like it's a safe place and a clean place. And the scenery is just outstanding. The food, I think you've entirely sold it. And however much Japanese food you might have tried here, it just doesn't sound like it's a patch on on the real deal. No, not at all. And I, I like last year, I, I escaped to Italy when we were allowed out of the country and a two week trip in Italy. Whilst I loved the food and it was great, I did find I was starting to eat similar kind of dishes after two weeks. Whereas Japan, I think you could have a two week trip and you can still eat something different for each meal and still not tried all of the different kind of foods that Japan has to offer, which which is really, really great. I have to plan my eating quite carefully every time I go back so I don't miss out on my favourites. Amazing. And how do they um, like how do you get on with if you have different dietary requirements? Um, dietary requirements, uh, that's a good question. Uh, Japan isn't the easiest of place for dietary requirements. Um, not many people have allergies. Um, the concept of vegetarianism or veganism is only really starting in Japan, which is strange because Buddhist monks are all vegetarians. So I don't understand how it hasn't really caught on in Japan. Um, so everybody literally eats everything. Um, so dietary requirements are, aren't the easiest of things to do in Japan, but it is possible. So what we usually do is we provide customers with an English and Japanese translation of what you can eat and what you can't eat. Um, and if you just show that in a restaurant, um, yeah, usually they're quite accommodating and they, they will go out of their way to, to make sure. So they're, they're, you can do it. Our, our, our directors are vegetarian and they lived in Japan for, for years. So you can cope with dietary requirements. It's just having that little bit of help to get by um, and know, know how to do it. Okay, so yeah, uh, uh, either having it um, pre-translated or something or having a guide with you. So um, with the, 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 the trips to, to Japan, would you either strongly recommend or always have um, a guide with you at all times? Um, the, the, I, I wouldn't say you need it all the time because um, it's <laughs> Japan's not the cheapest destination. So having a guide all the time that that can be really really expensive so what we usually recommend say if you're in Tokyo for three nights we would say you maybe have a guide for a full day in Tokyo um, to show you and add that local knowledge but actually getting around and doing things by yourself the public transport is easy people are kind people are friendly so you you, you do get by quite easily um those other times when you're not with a guide but you, I'd say for each destination you go to definitely have a guide for a day but the other days you can quite easily get around and do things by yourself and and yeah literally you don't have to look very hard to find amazing fascinating things in Japan so yeah yeah and so if you are out and about on your own um how easy is it to get lost in the city um, specifically yeah. It, it is quite easy to get lost in Japan because <laughs> they don't they don't have street names, which is really, really difficult. Um, but luckily now with apps and Google Maps and things like that, it is it is getting a lot easier to get around. But it can be quite confusing and difficult to navigate. And um, the trains and public transport is fine. It's just the street streets and the grid systems and all of that. That's quite complicated. Um, but people are kind, people are friendly. Quite often we have people looking at a map lost and people will come and help them and see that they're lost and help them out and get them to where they need to go. So um, yeah. I wouldn't worry about that. It's part of the fun of traveling around Japan. <laughs> and so you just mentioned about um, apps and things like that. Is, um, is there a lot of Wi-Fi around that's um, it like 
like is it the, the like in the cities is it the kind of modern place that a lot of people imagine that wi-fi is on the streets almost um it's it's strangely like japan is quite high tech in a lot of ways but in some ways it is really low tech so quite often a lot of our res- uh, our hotel reservations we still do by fax which is crazy <laughs> so um it's i wouldn't say wi-fi is widely available everywhere um, we usually include a portable Wi-Fi device for our customers um, that they've got with throughout the trip. But it is starting to catch on. So restaurants and public space, the train stations are starting to get Wi-Fi. And you can even get Wi-Fi on the top of Mount Fuji. So it, 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 it is, it, I wouldn't say it's as, as readily available as it here is in the UK, but it is getting better. That's quite impressive. Yeah. And um, so... It, it, when you're there and you're spending money and you're having eating in restaurants and things is it um credit cards are widely accepted or is it Um, cash that's actually a really interesting question in the past it was very much a cash-based society so everything was cash quite you'd rarely pay on credit cards um so we'd always recommend customers to take out cash but since the pandemic it's really changed and that credit cards and contactless has become more of a thing in Japan Um, so until I've actually gone back I can't say how completely it has changed but it is quite common in Japan to have cash and carry around lots of cash but it is safe to do so Um, well obviously take precautions as you would anywhere else in the world but it is predominantly a cash-based society but we'll see how that continues following the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely, because it's just changed everywhere, hasn't it, really, um, in a crazy way with the, the lack of cash around. But um, you mentioned briefly about um, pilgrimage routes and, and things like that. Are there some that are kind of shorter, a couple of days, or are they all monster hikes and trips? No, so um, it, there's there's a really nice um, walking route in the Japanese Alps called the Nakasendo Way and it's an old samurai route that they used to walk from Tokyo to Kyoto um, but there are there's this really beautiful section um, that uh, is between Magome and Sumago and it's only a three-hour walk it's a nice gentle walk through uh, countryside traditional villages and really easy to do so that's only two to three hours and 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 that is really really I I love to do it I've done it twice and love it but then if you do want something multi-day there's two day three day four day hikes along the Kamano Kodo which I explained earlier and you really don't need to do um, you don't need to be a, a keen hiker to be able to do some of them so um, my mother-in-law came out to Japan and she did part of the Kamano Kodo and she really wasn't in she didn't want to do much walking at all um, so we just did a, a few hours each day and actually one of the days the majority of it was along um, a, a river on a boat so you can't we, there's definitely easy routes and there are the more advanced ones so we can we can tailor make it or help um, find out what's best for you basically. Fantastic. So really, it's there is something for everyone and for all capabilities and all interests. Um, yeah, from the gardens and hot springs and just the contrasts of it all. It's it really is quite the the destination, I think, to to put on the list. So just yes. another one to have on the list. That's good. But uh, no, brilliant. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, oh, hang on. Another question. Uh, is it best to um, look at travel by train as opposed to in a car? I'd say, yeah, the public transport in Japan is amazing. It's It can get you pretty much everywhere. It's really easy. It's on time. It like, works like clockwork and it's clean. It's comfortable. Like oh, the standard class on the bullet train is is you've got far more leg room than you've got first class here in the UK. So it, it using the trains in Japan is an absolute joy um so I'd say most of the major sites on the main island you don't you you do it all by public transport as you start going into the more rural areas there there are some places where we would recommend a hire car um so if you do want to drive around there there are places you can do that they drive on the left hand side you can get an international driving permit so it is quite easy to do and the roads are really safe um but I'd say 90% 90% of the time tra- public transport is the way forward. Yeah. Great. Okay. And are there any other questions from anyone? 
No. Okay. Brilliant. Well, I've loved it. And I hope that everyone else has loved it and are able to take something away, at least a little nugget that you didn't know before about Japan. Um, but if you have any questions after this, then just let me know uh, and we'll try and get the answers for you. And if you have any feedback at all, please do send it along. Um, give me a call or email anything. It's lovely, always lovely to, to hear from you. So thank you. Um, and yeah, so in a, we're actually changing to uh, having these every two weeks from now, um, just because I know that things are opening up more um, coming out of lockdown. And, you know, I'm sure you're all going to be going to restaurants or something from next week. It's, uh, yeah, all a, a bit of change. But obviously, I don't want to end them because I think that they're, they're really valuable um, I'm really enjoying them. I'm loving being able to be in contact with all of you and also, you know, Matt and all the other wonderful uh, suppliers and partners that, uh, that we've been working with. So I'm really enjoying it. So until you all tell me that you want to stop and you've had enough, I might carry on for a bit. Um, so yeah, in two weeks time, but it's actually a Monday because um, it's Encounter Latin America and we're going wild in Patagonia, which will be incredible but they can't do uh, a Tuesday. So we're doing the Monday, the 24th. So I'll send out reminders anyway, of course. Um, and then after that, um, it will be two weeks after that, back on the Tuesday is Vietnam and Cambodia. And then a couple of weeks after that on the 22nd, uh, then we're coming back to have a look at uh, coach trips and escorted touring in the UK. So yeah, as, as usual, I'm trying to keep it all mixed up and bouncing around all over the world and if you have any other destinations that you'd like to see um, or learn about then let me know and I will try my best for you but uh, yeah so thank you very much all of you and thank you so much Matt that was fantastic um, I thoroughly enjoyed it and feel quite inspired about Japan and, excellent uh, thank you thank you for having me no you're welcome you're and I will see you all in a couple of weeks <laughs>